So the last week or two, I've kind of been incognito. I've been out of town. I've had jury duty as well. And it kind of took me a few days to get caught up. I, my internet was down overnight. And there were just so many different factors that kind of kept me from getting these videos up. I've been working on a few, and I just wanted to come back here today and say thanks to everyone who has been watching, who's stayed on the channel, and new subscribers. I've gained a couple of new subscribers in the last week, and I really appreciate each one. I really do. And I had planned to come and do an update on Amber Spradlin from Floyd County, Kentucky. Now, in the last week or two, it's come out. Some of the information has come out. Now, there will be court today in Floyd County, Kentucky. So, if anyone's in that area, the family's encouraging people to come and show up at the Floyd County Courthouse to support Amber. Um, I've been told that Dateline cameras will be there. So, apparently, they're planning on covering this story. But, information has come out recently about the night of the murder more details have come out. There's been a motion for bond reduction. I believe that may be what the court hearing is going to be about today. And um, there were some pictures released of M.K. McKinney after a few days, I think it was, after Amber's murder, showing that he had some scratches on his arm. DNA has been released, or the DNA information has been released and it's all in these court documents uh, now I want to say this is 12 13 pages long I may not read each and every word from the um, th court documents and I also want to say I'm trying to read this from my phone it's very tiny print so I'm having to enlarge it and if it sounds like I'm reading in a monotone it's because I'm trying to you know enlarge it and read it and then move on to the next page but I did want to read a little bit about this now this is posted on the Justice for Amber Facebook page this is from Debbie Hall who is the cousin of Amber this is Commonwealth of Kentucky verse Michael K McKinney the third who is also known as MK and he is the one that is still in jail and on um, and being charged with actual murder of Amber comes to the Commonwealth and for its response to the defendant's motion for bond reduction the Commonwealth objects to any reduction to the bond of the defendant MK McKinney it goes on to talk some more um, legal terms and terminology now we get down to the DNA evidence. The defendant quotes parts of the grand jury testimony. Now I also want to say before I finish reading this, there is a document out there, if I can post it, I will, where um, Amber's friend, Roy Kidd, who's now being blamed for this by the family, they've all decided that he's going to be the scapegoat. He's, he's the one that they're accusing of this crime. But the evidence doesn't show this. And the DNA evidence clearly shows whose DNA was found on Amber's body. Now I'm going to read this. This is um, evidence. The autopsy found that Amber Spradlin was stabbed at least 12 times in the head, neck, and torso. The attack was so violent that the blade from the knife used in the murder broke off in her neck and was only discovered during the autopsy. The nature and pattern of the injury suggest she resisted her attacker. Drops from Amber's fingernails clippings were sent for DNA testing after the initial test showed the possible presence of male DNA under her nails. A second, more specialized test was conducted to test for Y chromosome um, this is the male chromosome. Because the Y chromosome is inherited from the father's side, all males from the same paternal lineage share the same YSTR profile.
Forensic testing of Amber Spradlin's right hand fingernail clippings found that the major profile located under her nails was a match to defendant Michael McKinney the second and defendant M.K. McKinney and their paternal relatives. Now some people are saying that they found two different DNA um, the father and the son both of their DNA. Others are saying it's because it's the paternal lineage, the DNA from that side of the family. I'll get more into that as this trial unfolds and more comes out. I will come back and do a follow-up on all of that. But her, his, M.K. McKinney's um, DNA was found under her nails. So it just says that it could not come from a random male as though someone may have broken in. It would come from no other male in the U United States population. Um, it did not match defendant Josh Mullins, who has been named as a culprit or as a an accomplice in covering up the crime and cleaning up and removing evidence and that type of thing. He he hasn't been named as far as anything to do with the murder, like committing the murder. And her friend Roy Kidd, he has also been completely excluded from the DNA, even though the family's insisting that they think he killed her. Now, there is no evidence that someone outside of the home committed this murder and there was no evidence of a break-in. So obviously it could have been defendant Michael McKinney II or M.K. McKinney. Some people are asking if that's if there's a slight possibility that it may have been Michael McKinney, the father. Why wasn't he also charged with murder? So, any other males in the home, including Roy Kidd, are excluded as contributors to this DNA. On the subject of DNA, there is another important finding. Roy Kidd fell that night and sustained a large cut under his chin a few hours before the murder occurred. He was so intoxicated that he could not stand up on his own. As a result, Roy Kidd was covered in his own blood. DNA testing of the blood on Roy's clothing shows that it was his own blood and not any blood of Amber Spradlin's. In addition to being the only person present that night who left the scene before police arrived, defendant M.K. McKinney is the only person who had injuries on his hands and arms. And I will show some photographs that were taken by the police a few days after this occurred and he was brought in for questioning. More specifically, when police were finally able to photograph his arms three days after the murders, he was found to have numerous suspicious scratches. So while the DNA profile could have come from either him or his father, it was only MK who had these scratches. A defendant. Now here's the part if any of you watched any of this from other people's videos or from my videos that I've talked about, there was a 911 call that was made that morning. And this is this is a controversy because Floyd County chose to vote to move their 911 system from the Kentucky State Police to the Prestonsburg City Police. So when the first a 911 call came in at around 6 a.m. that morning. It was concerning Roy Kidd. The caller was M.K. McKinney, and he was telling 911 that this Roy Kidd was drunk, belligerent. They wanted him out of the house. Could they send someone to come and get him? But he kept telling them he did not want the man arrested. He just wanted him removed. The 911 transcript is here, and I will include that in the photographs. And he asks, you know, the police ask, is he committing a crime of some sort? Is he, you know, is there a reason why we should come and arrest him? And he said, no, he's just drunk, disorderly, and we want him out of the house. 
Well, this is at the time that the father, Michael McKinney, takes the phone and says to them, you know, don't bother, everything's under control. Now, that was the first 911 call. It had nothing to do with Amber, and as far as everyone knew at that moment, Amber was still alive at, at 6 a.m. Now, Defendant M.K. McKinney called 911 shortly before 6 a.m. that morning and stated that a family guest was extremely intoxicated and asked if police could send someone to get him. He did not name the individual, but it was obvious reference to Roy Kidd. Because Roy Kidd had fallen, they said that he was so drunk he couldn't stand on his own. Um, when asked the dispatcher if Roy Kidd was fighting or otherwise committing some sort of arrestable offense, M.K. McKinney declined to say. And he just said, I'm not, I'm not saying for you all to arrest him, just come and get him. But they did, and no one, you know, responded to the call. The father told them everything's okay, so it was just kind of dropped. Lauren Carlson was at the home that night with her boyfriend, defendant, Josh Mullins. She gave a statement to police saying that she and Josh left the victim, Amber Spradlin, alone in the living room when they went to bed at 7 a.m. that morning. Now, Amber was still alive at that moment. It was believed that Roy Kidd had passed out and gone to sleep in a basement bedroom at that point. This means that the murder had taken place sometime after 7 a.m. Defendant Michael McKinney II was asked by numerous people. Now, I want to point something out here for some of you. It's confusing. Michael McKinney II is the father, the dentist, Dr. McKinney and M.K. is his son. Defendant Michael McKinney was asked by people, when did def the defendant M.K. McKinney leave the house? Since he was not there when um, Amber was found at around 10 a.m., Michael McKinney told Lauren Carlson, Roy Kidd, and several others that M.K. had left during the night. However, surveillance video obtained by police shows M.K. McKinney's vehicle leaving at around 9 a.m. Between 8.30 and 9 a.m., I believe is what it says here. Um, so about an hour, an hour and a half after uh, Josh Mullins and his girlfriend said they went to bed at 7 a.m. and Amber was still alive at that point. So around an hour and a half to two hours later, M.K. leaves the house. They knew that, this, that it wasn't true that he had left during the night, as the father had said, because he made the 911 call to Prestonsburg City Police at around 6 a.m. He was at the house. So the surveillance shows still shots of M.K. McKinney's blue Chevy pickup truck leaving the area at just before 8.30 a.m., it says here. Um, there is another still shot of him um, arriving back at the area where his girlfriend's home was in Moorhead at around 10 a.m. So he flew to Moorhead. Um, someone flew. Someone drove very quickly to Moorhead. From Prestonsburg to Moorhead, I would say an hour and a half is good, but he must have been in a really big hurry to get there. Roy Kidd woke up in the basement bedroom sometime before 10 a.m. that morning. He had been so intoxicated that night that he had defecated and urinated on himself in the bed he was sleeping in. When he went upstairs, he discovered Amber Spradlin on the living room couch dead. He then knocked on the bedroom door of Michael McKinney, which was located only a few steps from where Amber lay dead. When defendant Michael McKinney came to the door, Roy Kidd told him that Amber was dead and covered in blood. Kidd states that Michael McKinney 
merely glanced over at her from the door of the bedroom, turned around, went back inside his bedroom, and began to make phone calls. Um, he did not even go over to Amber's body. Um, he glanced at her from the bedroom door. I believe, personally, I'm going to throw in my own opinion here, I believe they cleaned up as good as they could. MK leaves the home. Josh goes back to bed. Um, I'm assuming Josh was still there at this point because they had made no mention of seeing him having, you know, that he had left the house at that point. And they knew she was dead. They waited for Roy to wake up and find her body. This would lead them to be able to claim that he murdered her. They later talked about how he was so violent and and just, you know, talking about it. They portrayed him as being this um, out-of-control drunk that they could do nothing with. However, when, MK, when Michael McKinney makes the 911 call at about 10.30 that morning, after he called personal friends of his, including the former chief of police at that, who was the chief of police at that time, and he called these guys up before he calls 911. And he's speaking to Roy in a very casual manner, asking what was Amber's last name and what how old is she and stuff like that. He wasn't afraid of Roy. He wasn't saying, oh my God, there's a crazed lunatic here who just murdered a woman. So, instead of calling 911, Michael McKinney called his close friend, then Fressensburg City Police Chief Randy Woods. Phone records confirm an eight-minute long phone call between the two. When questioned by police, Randy Woods would only say that, M that Michael McKinney, the father, um, that he told him to call 911. And around 10.30 a.m., he finally did that. And um, there is the 911 um, transcript here, and it just says, 911, where is your emergency? Yes, my name is Michael McKinney. I'm at 659 Arkansas Road. I had some people come to my house last night, and there's a girl on my couch that's dead. 911 dispatcher asked him, confirm his address. He says, yes, I need some assistance. 911 says, okay, we'll get some people out there and ask him, is, is this your cell phone that he was calling from? He says, yes. He asked, 911 asks, do you know who this female is? And he asks Roy, what is her name, Roy? What's her name? Amber? What's her last name? Amber Spradlin? Roy is her, overheard saying Amber Spradlin. McKinney repeats this. To 911. Uh, and 911 asks, Is it obvious? Do you think it was a drug overdose? Or McKinney says, Dude, it looks like someone came into the house and fucking murdered her. Her fucking throat's slit. There's blood everywhere. Now, Roy Kidd says, He didn't go over to the body. He saw that it was obvious that there was blood on her, but how did he know her throat was slit at that moment because the position of her body from where uh, Michael McKinney was standing you could not tell that her throat was slit. I don't even think Roy knew that at that moment and okay so they ask how old she is and then they hang up as you can see defendant Michael McKinney told the 911 dispatcher that Amber Spradlin was murdered and that her throat had been slit the problem is that none of these injuries were visible or apparent upon observing the body at the scene. Because of the position of Amber's body on the couch, her chin was pushed forward, you cannot see any injuries to her neck. The authorities who responded to the scene, along with the deputy coroner, all believe that she had died from some sort of hemorrhage at that moment. And they didn't even see the, the slit to her throat at that moment. They saw the blood, and they thought she was hemorrhaging in some way. 
Um, in fact, the authorities, okay, uh, it was not until many hours later after the body had been examined at the coroner's office that it, that the injuries to her face, neck, and throat became apparent. The defendant, Michael McKinney, knew the exact nature of the victim's injuries. And he says to the 911 operator, she, her throat's been slit, even though the people who arrived on the scene to take her body could not tell that, and the coroner, after examining the body, discovered that. didn't wasn't visible or obvious to them when they first looked, just looked at her body. It is also notable that Michael McKinney is with Roy Kidd at the time of the 911 call. He's talking to him casually, asking... Uh, what's her name and all that and now he's describing Roy later now in the court documents and all as a deranged homicidal maniac who slaughtered a woman for no reason. Now we get to the missing cameras. Kenny's longtime housekeeper and Josh Mullins' then girlfriend Lauren Carlson say that the defendant had cameras in the living room and that they were aimed directly at the couch where the murder occurred. The, cap the housekeeper said it had been there as long as she could remember, and it was there the week the murder occurred when she cleaned the home. Now, this was prior to Amber's death. Lauren Carlson had been staying there and also confirmed that there was a camera in the living room. Now, this camera was missing when the police came and all the other cameras and, and the boxes and everything that went with it. I think a, a hard drive, maybe, was all missing. When police arrived on the scene that morning, the camera, along with another one that was in the basement bar area, were gone. Um, the fact that there was a camera would have filmed this murder was never mentioned to the police. They only learned of this during the investigation and interviews, and if the McKinney's had a camera that filmed the murder, you would think that they would have shown the authorities to prove that it was Roy Kidd, which is their theory. They would have said, look, we have this video of Roy Kidd, Kidd committing this murder. But those cameras were gone. So there's no proof that Roy Kidd had anything to do with any of this. He was simply... Amber's friend who accompanied her that night ended up back at this house and poor Amber ends up dead. Roy is passed out drunk in the basement. He's so drunk in fact that he urinates himself and he's cut himself badly. He's covered in blood and I guess maybe even though Michael McKinney's a dentist and you would think that he would know how blood and evidence like that works, he maybe assume the police would see Roy covered in blood and assume that he murdered Amber. So they're just arguing that if they had these cameras there and they are accusing Roy of having murdered Amber, they would definitely want the police to see that footage. But the cameras were gone and the footage was all gone. So, MK statements to Roy Kidd. MK... McKinney is Roy Kidd's second cousin, and Roy Kidd had genuine affection for M.K. While Roy Kidd and defendant M.K. McKinney were catching up um, in the early morning hours at Season's Inn, M.K.'s mother, LaDonna, stopped by to bring M.K. a pill. Roy went out and spoke to LaDonna, who is his first cousin. Now, LaDonna is the ex-wife of Michael McKinney and the owner of the Brick House restaurant where Amber Spradlin worked. Uh, Roy asked M.K. why his mother needed to come in the middle of the night to bring him a pill. What followed was a lengthy discussion between the two where he talked about some mental issues that he had been dealing with. M.K. stated that he had severe depression and was regularly suicidal. M.K. stated that he heard voices telling him to kill himself. 
M.K. mentioned that his grandmother had killed herself and that he was afraid he would end up like her. M.K. told Roy that dark voices told him to do bad things and put bad ideas in his head and that the voices were taking control of him. Roy was so concerned for M.K. that he texted his daughter at around 4.03 a.m. while the conversation was occurring and told her M.K. is suicidal. Roy told M.K. that mental illness was prevalent in their family and tried to comfort him. Again, all of these statements were made by defendant M.K. McKinney regarding his mental health, severe mental instability in the morning hours, before the murder. Now, did Roy Kidd confirm this? Did he say, yes, this conversation did take place? We did sit and talk about the fact that he was suicidal, having these dark voices, or was this MK's testimony later after the fact? A witness, a witness named Timothy Likens, who was a friend to the McKinney family and sometimes worked at Seasons Inn, provided information concerning a violent outburst that he saw occur at the McKinney home. According to the witness, it is common for groups of people to leave Seasons Inn after the bar closes and go to the home of Michael McKinney. Now, Michael McKinney's family also owned Seasons Inn, and Michael McKinney may have been co-owner in that um, they all left Brick House, when it closed and went to Seasons Inn, continued drinking until at least 4 a.m. We hear from M.K. himself saying this conversation he had with Roy Kidd about his mental health at 4 a.m. I don't know what time they all arrived back at the McKinney home, but this, this Timothy Likens says... Um, the night that this took place, Likens was... Now, this was not the same night of Amber's murder. This was a different uh, um, night. Likens was present with the McKin in the McKinney home, and they were all down in the basement where he had a bar set up, and he says there was probably 20 people or more there. According to Likens, M.K. McKinney pulled a knife and said he was going to kill everyone there. Everyone had to leave, and M.K.'s father argued and fought with him, trying to make him throw down the knife. Likens further described M.K. as a ticking time bomb, whose mood would change like a light switch. So, when M.K. McKinney's truck was finally located and searched three days after the murder, a document was discovered in, indicating that M.K. was in treatment for anger management. This, dis this discovery led investigators to obtain treatment records, and these records are voluminous and go back many years. They document many incidences of suicidal ideas, attempts at self-harm, as well as his inability to control his anger. Now, some people are saying that MK and his lawyers are going to use this as a way to try to point, paint him as someone with mental health issues. So in the conclusion of this document, it is the Commonwealth's position that the evidence strongly implicates that M.K. McKinney murdered Amber Spradlin, and there is enough evidence to charge him with this. But it shows that the M.K. McKinney, Michael McKinney, that their lawyers are trying to point the finger now at Roy Kidd. They're saying that Roy Kidd failed a lie detector test. Um, I don't know how many hours it was after Amber was found. Roy went to the police station. He let them take DNA and stuff from his body. He spoke to police willingly and told them what he could remember about that because he was very intoxicated. He was the one to find Amber's body on the couch, but there was nothing on his body, um, the blood, or, or it was all his. His DNA was not found on Amber. 
They were saying he failed this lie detector test, but keep in mind, he was a very good friend to Amber. He was very upset. And they don't believe that he, that he killed her. The police don't. They're not trying to build a case against him. They don't believe there's anything to build against him. The lawyer's false said in the DNA is all proven that he could not have contributed to the, the DNA found on Amber's body. It's only the McKinney family that's trying to put a finger at Roy Kidd. And like I said earlier, the cameras were removed purposely. Not just the cameras, but all the hard drive and everything that would upload. And it may still be in a cloud somewhere out there. Maybe someone in the police force can find that. But they do have surveillance of MK leaving the house. Even though the father said he left during the night, it was around 8.30 in the morning before he left. Arrived back at Moorhead at around 10 a.m. And um, so their attempts to point the finger at someone else is just not going to fly here. I don't think anyone believes what they... Oh, well, I'm sure there are some people that do want to give them the benefit of the doubt and believe that they are telling the truth. But that's what I have right now on Amber Spradlin. Like I said, there will be a court hearing today for this motion to reduce MK's bond. Uh, they're asking people in the community to come out and support Amber and show support. And Dateline cameras will be there. I'm sure there will be a lot of local news organizations and online um, podcasters and such will be there. And whatever comes out later today, I will come back and do a follow-up. Thanks for watching.